Hello, this is Nikki Keohoho, CEO and co-founder of the Direct Selling World Alliance. I have with me today for our executive forum, Bobby Wasserman. She's an award-winning public relations executive and has helped to shape the communications landscape of today's global brands and build the reputation of tomorrow's leading companies. She's a veteran of global public relations agencies, Fleischmann, Hilliard, and Edelman, where she served as a vice president in the public affairs and the corporate reputation and crisis management practices. She transferred her skills to the direct selling industry in 2011 in working with Arbonne and then as vice president of public relations for Vaisalis, where she set up department infrastructure and directed global communications efforts during the company's hyper growth period. Uh, Bobby has earned an MBA in finance from USC and a BA of economics from UCLA. She's quite a smart individual and a fun person. I've had the opportunity to work with Bobby for some time over a couple of clients that have had some challenges and she stepped in and I was so proud to have the opportunity to introduce her to these people. So Bobby, thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, thanks, Nikki. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, we're excited to hear what you've got to share. Our industry has changed so many ways and and will only continue to change. You know, today we want to provide our members with a new perspective on communications with a focus on the crisis process and how that can be integrated into direct selling companies' current business and business strategy. Well, as with other industries, technology has changed the opportunities for direct sellers, and as technology evolves, so must the industry. Specifically, there's a need for more robust communications on a corporate level. Historically, direct sales companies have left public relations efforts to their distributors, so it's always the distributor's responsibility to promote their own business. It worked and was extremely successful. However, with technology and the amount of information available at the click of a mouse, it's essential for each uh, direct selling company to establish its reputation and communicate its culture and milestones. That will help current direct selling distributors build their businesses and attract new distributors as well as customers. So true. So what is the agenda for today? Well, crisis communications generates from the executive suite, so we're going to start with corporate communications and how to build an arsenal of content along with a general crisis process that should get everyone thinking. We'll tie all that information together through our case study at the end of the presentation. So let's start right away with corporate communications and its relationship to crisis management. So corporate, corporate communications is the department responsible for communicating to a company's various audiences and ensuring that the communication resonates with those various audiences. That includes current and potential distributors, current and potential customers, investors, influencers, employees, etc. Uh, most direct selling companies have mid-level communication professionals that report to marketing and that is a model that's really residual of how the business used to run. It doesn't reflect the needs of the industry today. So company communications should generate from one department and be disseminated through the direct sales channels, all the different channels? Yes, I've kept the model uh, pretty basic and broad for today's discussion and segmented general areas of company communications into three buckets public relations, distributor communications, and social media. Now, public relations is really creating a positive, is really creating positive content for the company overall through a variety of channels. Everything from CEO speeches to blog content to press and media. But distributor communications is critical as everyone knows. Distributors sell our products, but they also convey the image and culture of the company that helps shape the company's reputation. And everyone is familiar with the power of social media. But remember that social media is a tactic that amplifies what the company is trying to communicate about its brand, products, people, and culture. So you want to make sure you get that branding, products, and culture right 
so it can be amplified correctly through that social media channel. So generating positive content at the corporate level and being the keeper of that content is where crisis communications unites with corporate communications. Hmm. So can you discuss for a few minutes the different types of content and its importance to crisis communications? Absolutely. Given all the types of content now, I like to think of content, again, in three buckets, text, image, and video. So this categorization will become important when a crisis or issue that needs a response arises. So text is really the foundation of online and social communication. It's the basis of messaging, posting, and tweeting. And the direct selling industry has millions of distributors that use these channels spreading positive content about the company and the industry. So image, images are evolving into the basis of storytelling. 90% of information that is transmitted to the brain is visual, and articles with images get 94% more views than those without. And video, uh, mobile is really driving video, and YouTube reaches more people in key advertising demographics than any cable network in the United States. So it really brings the brand story to life. It's extremely powerful. The secret weapon of distributing this content is the distributor, no matter what type of content that you have. A direct selling companies have a distinct advantage here, but few realize how to successfully engage the distributors during a crisis. Think of each distributor for your company as a social media channel, and the power of their sharing positive content consistently with their downlines and customers. So there's some different platforms with different uses. Can you talk about that for a few minutes? Sure. Uh, basically, uh, it becomes, once you have your content uh, ready to go, it becomes about what platforms people expect to experience the specific types of content. For example, most people will watch videos on YouTube. For images only, they go to Instagram or Pinterest. And as we know, text is everywhere. So remember, people tend to gravitate towards those platforms for certain content out of habit. If I'm on Facebook checking out my feed, I'm expecting to read some content, but most likely that text will now be accompanied by an image or a video. So it becomes about where to distribute content, knowing that it will eventually reach numerous channels. But you want those people to engage initially you know, on the platform for where they are expecting that content to appear. Mm -hmm. So the content and communication strategy really sets the stage for crisis management. Absolutely. So today I want to discuss really some basic crisis or issue scenarios that might occur in a direct selling company's standard course of business. This does not include natural disasters, terrorist attacks, or other national or global tragedies. Those are critical to plan for, yet not very common in the day-to-day -day operations of the vast majority of direct selling companies. So the title of, of your slide here is perfect. It's not if, it really is when. Yes, and today information spreads so quickly, you really need to prepare to respond immediately. So with the unlimited number of scenarios that could potentially occur, how can a company anticipate any one specific situation? Well, the most important thing you can do is be prepared. So that's, that's, let's, so let's start there. Uh, you'll need to anticipate what can go wrong. So there are situations that a company can create, like layoffs or a merger, perhaps the anticipation of a leader leaving, and you can predict some of the negative reactions and plan uh, and plan the content accordingly. There are also situations that arise around product ingredients, product safety, and I really classify those as normal business risk for those types of uh, those types of companies. Um, let's take health and wellness for example, and go through identifying some issues based on selling ingestible products. So first. Uh, you'll need to understand each ingredient, the manufacturing process, certifications, etc. This should be housed in communications, if not communications, then marketing. 
have all this research written out in an easy to read format for reference. Personally, I use Excel a lot. So product development and regulatory should have the answers um, to get the information that you need. And you can anticipate potential distributor and customer questions by talking with distributors about what questions come up at product events. Uh, some companies do this formally through what they call a distributor council. And they'll even be able to promote that council as a cultural element of the company, and which can enhance the company's reputation. Again, with the products, you'll also want to take a look at your competitors, direct selling and non-direct selling, to see what issues have come up for them. When I was in-house, I did this constantly when Herbalife was in the news, you know, how we would answer the charges that, were, uh, that Herbalife was having to answer. For nutritional products, one issue that tends to come up is caffeine. So uh, if it's in the product or not, and how much uh, caffeine is in the product, if it's present. For example, uh, one client of ours has caffeine in their nutritional shake, which is common. Uh, but when concerns arose around the levels of caffeine in the shakes, we're able to get the amount of caffeine from regulatory and then take that information and equate it to a, the amount of caffeine in a Starbucks tall coffee. So that was a very familiar product. It was in our messaging and then it alleviated the caffeine concerns uh, of the customers. So you'll also want to identify uh, your crisis management team early on. It's a very small C-level core team as well as legal counsel. Uh, one word of warning, uh, lawyers usually don't want their clients to say anything and in the communications business today, uh, in the court of a, if you don't say anything in the court of a public opinion, that means you're guilty. So be sure to have an executive level communications person in those meetings uh, whether it's an agency or an internal person, to work with the attorneys to develop effective statements which meet the legal needs of the company as well as the public relations needs of the company. Um, once you have your crisis team, you're going to identify the spokespeople, be sure they're trained, uh, and establish a notification system in case of a crisis, how the team will be reached. You'll also want to identify your key stakeholders. So distributors are your primary stakeholders, and they are usually the first in line to receive information that the company puts out about a situation. Other stakeholders include employees, investors, and others that have a vested interest in the company. If there is a culture of collaboration, distributors will uh, also give corporate a heads up on what they are hearing on social media or through other channels regarding the situation at hand. So once you've come this far in preparing for a crisis, you'll want to actively monitor the communication channels online and off. Social media is the primary platform. And also be sure to continue a dialogue with distributors, um, know what employees are saying, and monitor the internet to understand what is being said about your company. This is not compliance monitoring, although claims is a piece of it. It's monitoring about what is being said about the company from that umbrella perspective. Um, that I mentioned earlier. So when an issue comes up, be sure to write, uh, be sure to write your holding statements. Well, these are one and two sentence statements that allows the company in a, a very initial broad response while gathering more facts about the issue. It makes the company look very responsive and on top of the situation, even if you're not. A typical holding statement will be very brief recap of the issue, followed by we're currently looking into the situation. If you're going to issue a holding statement, be sure to follow it up with what you've learned and how the issue was, was resolved. Uh, for example, uh, a client had an issue with a customer calling uh, stating that the product that they had used from this company had paralyzed them and their six-year-old child. The so customer service transferred the call to legal, legal called us, and we dealt with the situation and sent the country manager just in case the media was alerted. Um, by the customer, we sent the co country manager um, holding statements. It, it was a very quick and effective process. So that leads us to the next phase of crisis management, which is the response. So once the holding statement is issued and you have some breathing room to further uh, assess the issue. For example, with our paralysis victim, we did some 
quick internet research to find out that this person was known for product advocacy and calling out companies on certain products and ingredients. A response to her, uh, to her was to offer immediate medical assistance, an ambulance, whatever she needed, which she of course refused. So we wrote up specific messages should this situation reach the press. Those messages included the mention of manufacturing certifications, the history of the compliant and her product advocacy, and uh, what we were anticipating and that and actually happened, her refusal to take any medical help for herself or her child. So while this situation never reached the press, the country manager was ready with, specific, with a specific hard-hitting response uh, of the ridiculous claim. So a common direct selling company threat uh, comes from negative articles towards the industry or a specific company. Uh, honestly, I get these calls on negative articles all the time and dealt with it on a daily basis when I was in house. If an article comes to your attention, you first look at the number of shares. If there's not a lot, just monitor the engagement. Most articles do not get a lot of engagement, and if this is the case with the specific one you're monitoring, then just let it die online. Don't comment, don't try to correct it, let it just get buried under new news. That's uh, easier said than done, because you want to correct the record, but don't do it because the article is dead, and you're just going to be stirring up something and starting something. So um, let's, let's talk about the post-issue analysis. Uh, that is absolutely critical in every situation. What worked? What can we do to improve? And that goes from the crisis response to any impacted department of the company. If there's some wording in our marketing material that needs to be changed, any shipping or delivery process improvements, this will make your, better, your company a better company and a better prepared company. And these calls or meetings can be a brief 15-minute uh, you know, conference call with all the parties or a much more formal review process, you know, depending on the uh, gravity of the situation. So, Bobby, this is really great information. How about looking at another actual situation and how that was handled? Of course. Online crisis response, that incorporates all the elements we've discussed is an issue that Organogold had in early 2014. It's a very typical direct selling problem, and it's a, really a warning to all privately held direct selling companies. So I received a call from a reporter at CBS Money Watch, and the reporter started asking very typical questions. Why was the company not a member of the DSA? You know, there were potential health claims made by distributors, and then they, uh, talked about a supposed FTC issue. The questions were so broad that they could really be targeted to any direct selling company. And the reporter gave us six hours to answer his questions before the article came out. So what's important to know with this type of reporter and request was that his story was already written. And to legitimize it, he gave us a chance to respond to his accusations, uh, which we did. But we also put our content crisis plan into action at that time. Um, but uh, and our goal was to push down the negative story that was going to come out. Uh, we, we did get back to him, but we did um, we wanted to flood the internet with positive content and have the distributors share that content continuously once the article came out. But there's also an important note to this. It's uh, to the situation that everyone should consider. A day after this article appeared, it was announced that Herbalife was being investigated by the FTC. So this reporter really just wanted to be in that conversation from a journalistic point of view. He picked on a privately held direct selling company that would not be expected to respond appropriately so his article could get traction and he would be called on by the CBS editors to continue his investigation. So this is really a warning um, that it doesn't matter if you're private or public, it matters that you're a direct selling company. That makes you a target. So in all this, uh, within his story, uh, knowing that it was going to be published, our goal was to push 
the negative story down in the search engines by flooding the internet with positive content and have the distributors share that content continuously. For text, uh, we had a company product launch with Greg Norman and we continually shared that press release along with all the product information and the launch recap uh, blogs, taking bits and pieces of the story and releasing it slowly in drips and drabs over one to two weeks. For photos and, image and videos, we did the exact same thing. We released 25 pictures at a time out of the 908 event launch pictures we had, uh, continually asking people to share, comment, and link. And we did the same with the videos, editing videos to about one to three minutes for sharing over social media channels. And then all this content rollout was coordinated and staggered. Uh, we also let the leaders know what was going on, and so they were helped being pushed out the content. So we really leveraged the distributors with this. And uh, within 20 minutes of publication on the CBS website, the story, this story was on page 7 of Google. Uh, no one goes to page 7 of Google. <laughs> so it was basically dead. So as long as, uh, and as long as we were leading the corporate communication efforts, that story never got above page 7. Well, that's exciting. So what are the important lessons here? So really, companies must, uh, must understand uh, all the communication channels and platforms today and have a strategy in place to tell their story uh, throughout those channels and platforms. Uh, uh, content is really king here, especially for direct selling companies. Uh, train your distributors to effectively use online communication channels proactively and give them a corporate contact to report and discuss any negative content. Um, but you, what you really want to do is you want to develop a plan, attach a relevant budget, and then obtain executive buy-in. Hmm. It is important that we follow these lessons. These are experiences that will pay off in the long run because it's sad to say, but there will be things that will happen to every company along the way. And being prepared is the best approach to that. So, Bobby, I've got to say thank you so much for being part of our executive forum today. And, and thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. And again, the way to get a hold of Bobby is by contacting 917-747-6879. Of course, that's in the U.S. or internationally. And Bobby's email is bobby, B-O-B-B-I-E, at wave2alliances.com. So thank you again, Bobby, and it was a joy to work with you. And I always learn in your presence. My pleasure, Nikki. Thanks so much for having me.